excellent cool dan how are you doing for the second time um so <laughs> really well thanks <laughs> yeah so just for everyone to know uh we did speak with each other last week however it was slightly interrupted by uh my son who's currently at home uh fortunately today he has a babysitter so this is this is good it's a good start um yeah. Yeah. Work, so we'll be living yeah um yeah so dane uh is joining today and uh dane has a background in farming uh, as uh, his family's business is farming uh, from there he decided to continue down this route and he's focused on breeding and it's taken him through a few different steps where he's now working with planas at the moment so previously Dana asked just for general background of, um, you know, was it because you were from a farming background that you came into farming? Or was it just a natural progression? Or did you feel you could develop more and grow more uh, by taking that path? Um, I think it's very much a two pronged answer, or there could be two factors. Um, my whole family i'm one of five kids i'm the only one that's gone into farming um i think from farming you learn a lot you gain a lot of independence and you develop a love for the outdoors or for nature but for farming i feel it's more of, it's in your blood it's it's something that you feel passionate about that drives you and you get you feel a pull towards um so i feel for myself i had the exposure i was fortunate to that but even if i hadn't grown up on a farm i would have been pulled towards the agricultural background um and then yeah because of that passion the more i learned the more i wanted to learn or the more i wanted to get into things um and yeah the more you get exposed to the more you want to find out well what else is going on so for example you know i was i was farming as a technical manager with salad and herbs mm -hmm. and i thought wow this is a big change from animals and row crops in zambia or uganda and that is your background but yeah, it's part of part of the background. Yeah, I'd say the, the salad and herbs was really where my technical and planning side developed the most because there every day it's a harvest, every day it's land preparation, planting, all of that stuff. So you have to be quite on it. Um, and it's a very quick crop. So you have to make sure it's fed correctly so that you get the correct type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and of course, with salad, you know, you're eating the leaf. So you're doing everything you can in an open air environment to make sure that leaf is perfect in yeah. the packet for the consumer um so i think that quite nicely flowed into now what my passion is in blueberries yes you know, a passion for detail and a passion for what are the technical and physiological things you have to focus on to get the most from a blueberry plant while yeah. at the same time not throwing every chemical or every fertilizer but to do it in an efficient and more environmentally sustainable way yes um, and as you know things are expensive now so you can't just throw everything at it yeah, one one aspect that I definitely want to touch on a little bit later is uh, the whole difference between organic, non-organic, mm -hmm. what constitutes organic in different markets and all these different factors, mm -hmm. especially with you mentioning the production costs, also adding an extra element. But um, leading you into blueberries, from memory, you worked uh, for part of your career with Fall Creek, and then it was directly after Fall Creek that you moved to Planasa. Um, yeah, there was a little interim there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just give a little bit of background with regards to Fall Creek? Because my understanding is it's a North American based uh, breeder as well. Yeah, very, very much a breeding and nursery. <clears throat> yeah. They kind of, they always go together really. Um, but yeah, Fall, Fall Creek is based in Oregon, USA. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be corrected, but I think they're about 45 years old now. Mm -hmm. um, they were founded by a couple called Dave and Barbara Brazelton, um, lovely people, and they had a real passion for for blueberries. And so, yeah, they they started over there on a small nursery, and it just it has grown and grown from there. And then a while ago, they saw potential in Mexico, and they decided, right, let's approach that market, and it just boomed with it. And, of course, along came Peru. Everyone knows how from nowhere Peru started growing as well. Yeah. So I think the growth of Fall Creek went hand in hand with the growth in South America. Um, and then from there, they realized there's global potential and it led them to Spain where they set up a nursery. 
and they set up a nursery in South Africa. Um, I started working for them in 2019. Yeah. We built the nursery in 2020. Um, so it was all quite a, a rapid production. Yeah, Four Creek's doing very well in Southern Africa, and there was a good uptake with their varieties. Um, they've got a broad spectrum of what they can offer. Their first speciality, or let's say first focus in their beginning, was high chill varieties, purely based on where they are. When they are in, okay, originally in Oregon before they moved yes. down. Okay, exactly. Yeah, and then from there, with the developing regions, of course, comes a need for other varieties or chill zones. So now they go right from zero to high chill um and yeah they've got some fantastic people in charge of the breeding and as a result they've had great varieties and i think anyone listening or watching this will know of sequoia they okay. you know those superb varieties um and they've done really well in the actual marketing or advertising of those so now it's you know synonymous everywhere yes um but yeah i don't know what else you might like to know about the yeah. company just a little bit more with regards to fall creek so obviously they started in oregon and then um you know, there's there's huge growth in uh, South and Central America. Hmm. Did they take advantage? Well, not take advantage. Did they benefit from that situation? In essence, did they have the products, uh, some of the varieties which could be placed in those locations? So, did they see the growth that those countries saw? Very, very much so. They, you know, there was a reason why they went there. They had to make the decision right. There's potential now. Do we do it? Do we go into another area? away from stuff that we know based on the potential. So, you know, I think any company would see the potential and take that up. You know, it makes business sense to follow yeah. the potential. So yeah, they benefited, uh, I'd say quite a lot from the Mexican growth and the per Peruvian growth. Um, I mean, if you look at the stats, it's mostly in the beginning, Biloxi and Ventura that were planted. You know, oh, like was that from them? Properties. Yeah, they've, they had a hand in that and- okay. Also, because, like I said, they're a nursery as well, they can provide the plants. Yes. So, you know, if, if they're able to grow the plants, they can sell the plants as well. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so that was a, a huge benefit to them there. And now being so so well established in the area, they also can focus more on their particular varieties that they've bred, such as the Three Amigos and then a few new varieties like Azra Blue or Olympus Blue. Um, you know, from the Biloxi and Ventura experiment, they've been able to breed more specifically for the areas. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, Biloxi and Ventura are definitely varieties I'm very familiar with. Um, when you look at market reports, in particular in China, uh, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. So it's very yeah. interesting to know the, the backstory then. Mm -hmm. um, so going from... Uh, Fall Creek to Planasa. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, also a breeding uh, company, nurseries across the world. Um, how do you view Planasa's approach onto the market since you're in South Africa, in particular South Africa? Uh, since South Africa is mainly exporting to Europe, pretty much mainly the UK with uh, excess volume going to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, from what I'm aware, China isn't open yet for South Africa. Uh, it would be great if you could expand on that. Yeah. Well, I think I think I'll start from from the end of your your question there, so the China point, and then yeah. my way back, and I'll jump around a little bit. <laughs> Take it easy. Uh, Take it easy. Yeah. So yeah, China. I mean, it's a continual discussion. Um, some could say that it's a difficult country to get into, but at the same time, it's also the people we rely on to get us in there. You know, we have to convince. Very subtle. <laughs> no, hundred percent. There's there's a there's many steps to the chain, and it's a mm -hmm. bureau it's a bureaucratic approach. It is very much so. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a free market approach. It's a bureaucratic layers mm -hmm. approach. And what are the benefits? Um, I think right now, if I remember right, avocado is the focus at the moment. Fair enough. Uh, we're trying to get blueberries higher up on that list, particularly because it has one of the highest labor factors for South Africa. Um, we're very far from going machine harvest. Mm -hmm. um, our labor is still cheap enough that we can focus on that for our varieties. But we also have to keep in mind, most of our regions are around the low to mid chill zones. So our varieties don't ripen all at once and have one or two picks like you might get in a high chill zone. 
it's a repeated pick over you know from anywhere from every three to ten days so if you put a machine through that shake the bush you're going to get maybe 30 percent blue and 70 percent green berries it doesn't help mm. so it's much better to you know it has to be hand-picked very it's interesting the same as what you get in peru and mexico machine harvest is always going to be a far off thought for that just because the varieties don't ripen in, in enough of a concentrated window yeah you know, the, the bulk window. curve is more flat mm. so to speak rather exactly. than a nice beautiful peak yeah okay um, and also they're, they're very temperamental or influenced by the season mm -hmm. so sometimes if you have a cold snap during the ripening a good break up and create more of a spread out harvest window then if the cold snap happens at a different time you can get more of a peak so you know like every farmer says and i think almost every blueberry person will say is you don't actually know everything you're always learning and the plant is always showing you who's boss you will never know everything and it'll always change its mind very 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 uh, uh frigid yeah exactly so fickle, very fickle there you go fickle, very much so <laughs> So, yeah, so China is a big focus for, for South Africa, but a country that has got access in Southern Africa is Zambia. Yes. However, they don't really have any blueberry farms. There's one United export that I know of. Yes. I think they put 100 hectares um, in Zambia. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure how it's going there, but the climate, it's a, the right climate for it. Um, and hopefully they've done everything right because I think Zambia could be a good example or a stepping stone to get Southern Africa into China more to show that we offer a more high quality niche type berry. We'll never be at volumes like Peru. However, because of our ripening window, yes. we can provide very high quality berries with good sizes, et cetera, et cetera. So you can target those niche moments when the market needs quality. Um, so yeah. Okay. And then your other window about, uh, window, question Sorry. about Planeta. Yes. Yeah. So yes, also also a breeding company. So Four Creek is solely blueberries. Mm -hmm. They're the biggest blueberry nursery in the world. And then Planassa is the biggest nursery in the world. And I might stand corrected, but that's what it seems like. But they don't just do blueberries. Blueberries is a very new aspect to their um, basket. Um, in the beginning, there were things like asparagus and onion and garlic. And then there's the strawberries and the raspberries, which they're very well known for. Um, you might know varieties like the raspberry called Adelita mm -hmm. um, has the unique ability where they can plant it and provide fruit during winter in Europe. Um, and then we've got some great strawberry varieties like Red Syrah, um, which is a new one coming out. So they, they've got very strong arms in those fruit. And they're like, okay, well, let's get into the blueberry window. And this is where I think they were very smart in the sense that they looked at what is actually required. What does the market want from a blueberry plant? We get to start completely from fresh. We don't have to follow anything. There's nothing pushing us a certain way. It's a blank so slate. No, exactly. no investment. It's, yeah, it's a blank slate of how to approach the market. Exactly. Because, I mean, when you breed any variety, it doesn't matter what crop, it can cost millions. So even if you breed the wrong one, you kind of need that to make a bit of money if you commercialize it. Whereas here, we didn't have that pressure. So we looked at the market and they thought, okay, one, everyone's looking for early. That's a global trend now. Everyone is going earlier, earlier, earlier. Okay, that's number one. What else? Good shelf life. So that means with shelf life comes eating quality. So a nice firmness, flavor, size, bloom, etc. We've got to tick all those boxes. Okay, we'll focus on those characteristics. And then what else? Easy to grow. Okay, so now we've got like three key things to focus on. And with that information, they were able to breed these varieties, which they released in 2019. Yes. Which tick exactly those uh, criteria. So and now the, some of the earliest varieties in their regions. And these these varieties uh, that they released, uh, which ones do you see that stand out, which you really do see as a formidable entries to the blueberry market? So it, it Grant, kind of Grant, comes... I understand you're going to have a little bit of a bias because you work with mm -hmm. Planasa, but uh, I think you're going to be fair in saying, <laughs> look, these varieties are definitely uh, ideal and maybe yeah. they compare it to X, Y, Z. And this is how I, how mm -hmm. I feel they are. 
Yeah, no, you're, you're allowed to have your own favorites in the company as well, I think. <laughs> naturally, naturally. <laughs> um, what I was going to say there is that also depends where you grow it. Yes. And to, to explain that, let's look at two of the earliest varieties we have called Manila and Marina. So Manila is considered the earliest and then Marina. But Marina is like right behind it. Manila's yield isn't as high, but it's got a really good quality berry with a really good shelf life. Mm -hmm. Whereas Marina's got a higher yield with a slightly more questionable shelf life compared to Manila. Not saying it's bad. But, yeah. You know, in this comparison, I'm just comparing our varieties to each other. Yes, yes, yes. So if you're in Morocco, Marina is the obvious choice. Why? Because you just hop over and you're in the European market. Shelf life is not as a big a question as is in Southern Africa. And then with Marina, I mean, there's been a few people that have had anywhere from seven to nine kilograms of bush. That's massive. Big berries. It has a sweet flavor and it's super early. The Moroccan, they start trickling in now already with the massive varieties from November. Just to give you an idea of how early we're starting to come now. Yes. Um, whereas if you're in South Africa, Manila is a great choice because why? It has a good shelf life and it's super early. So instead of getting really high yields, you can still get a four to five kilogram, which is considered high. But you're so early in the market that your kilogram or your dollar per kilogram is higher, which then makes up for that slight reduction in yield. That's so true. in Southern Africa, I quite like Manila. Yes. Marine is great, but I don't think it's right for our market. Okay. We then have Malibu and Madeira, which are also fantastic varieties. This is clearly uh, M's or the, the, the variety of, or the name of choice. Anything with an yeah, M. Yeah, they kind of go for names in the area. So if you think, you know, it's like towns in that, maybe yeah. next one will be called Malta or something. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, Malibu and Madeira, also they, they work both down here and up north. Malibu being a slightly more technical one, but very, very delicious berry. Um, it takes quite a, a knowledgeable grower to understand the physiology and how to manipulate it. it has very specific pruning time. And then Madeira is your grower friendly variety. So a comparison to another ones is like uh, maybe Atlas. It's big, it's vegetative, and it just grows. Um, and when you when you say grower friendly, it really means uh, less hands on attention. Yeah, less hands-on. It's fairly hardy. It's, it's more resilient to uh, mistakes or changes in the climate. Yeah, that's that's the perception of it. And then now we come to what is my particular favorite, and it's becoming a favorite in Zimbabwe. It's a variety called Maldiva. Well, I mean, who, who's not going to like the Maldives, right? Exactly. Okay, Maldiva. <laughs> um, this this variety you know pretty much has everything big berries it's the biggest berries of the the our category so all yes. of them are from large to jumbo but maldiva is the jumbo um so it does also it might limit you a bit to what, what market you can go to because some markets only want a 16 mil um but i mean for example in zim if they have early berries they actually try and target you know the asian countries in the middle east where they want bigger berries which works perfectly for them so yeah these this maldiva has a high yield, um, has these big berries, great flavor, good shelf life. And it also, it just grows. It needs very little manipulation once you've done a prune or once you've planted it. Yes. Um, it does have a slightly haphazard growth, but it still produces really well. So yeah, so that's come becoming a favorite. And even though it's number five in our varieties of timing, it's still early and we already have fruit now in April in Zimbabwe. Yes. Very interesting. So, I mean, there's two there's two questions that come come mm -hmm. to mind. One, I just want to go back to the organic topic, um, and how that relates to these different varieties. So, if you if you're a grower, and obviously you have all your different in, inputs, and you're seeing the market, the demand side market change in favor of uh, organic when the price is right. Mm -hmm. How much of a decrease, generally speaking, that doesn't have to be specific to Planasa, generally speaking, how much of a decrease of yield would you typically see in an organic farm versus, um, let's call it a, a traditional uh, volume farm? I don't know if this is the right terms, but... Uh, no, you're pretty, pretty on point there. Um, well, firstly, I mean, 
it would come down to experience. And I haven't experienced any organic blueberry farms here in Southern Africa. I've heard of one or two that didn't go very well. I think part of the problem was that they were set up on original farms that had other crops. Yes. You have other crops that are receiving chemical sprays. Your pests and that will migrate to an easier crop. Okay. So you're, you're in essence uh, directing them towards uh, the only blind spot or the only place they can really feast. Exactly. And also okay. when they tried it, our biological companies weren't as developed as they are now. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge focus in Southern Africa now for more biological approach. It's just becoming more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, let's also not forget that blueberries have quite a limited uh, selection of chemicals that you can use. So you have to look at the other options and other different types of management. And then during flower period, you're even more limited because you can't have, um, risk any MRLs in your fruit. If you spray during flower, there's a very high risk of MRL issues in your fruit. Yes. So there again, we've had to look at our biologicals and you get various ones from like real IPM or Dudu Tech um, or Coppet. And you'll look at lures, which have sort of certain pheromones in a bucket or something like that that will attract a particular sex of a pest species and then kill it in there. You have some sprays that use like almost like a pathogen approach. Um, and then it's also having a healthy plant, eh? A healthy plant that's not under stress usually won't suffer much damage. The, the insects don't like it. To give you an example, a thrip, which is a big issue for everyone. Yes. Thrips don't like plants with a high bricks level in their leaf of 18 or more. Mm -hmm. And thrips will also go for a plant that has too much nitrates. They, well, they almost look at the plant with like an infrared vision. And it shines out to them. So, you know, if you're not managing your crop with the correct practices, you're asking, you're opening the door and saying, come eat my crop, please. So, so thrips do not like high bricks mm. and they prefer high nitrates. Yeah. If you've put too much nitrogen, particularly nitrates, but I mean, nitrates are actually what's in your leaf more so. Yes. Your, what we call nitrites, your NH2, NH3, NH4 are based around the roots. If you've got a high nitrogen recipe in your crop, your thrips will, and possibly a lot of other sucking insects as well. Very, very interesting. Um, and then, so on to the organic question. One, yes. we don't really export much organic here. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's really never picked up. We haven't had the demand, I guess, to 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 justify it. Yes. I think it also comes down to, it's, I don't want to say risk, but the challenge. As, as a grower, you don't want to now, Try and get your organic to work, and then you don't get a crop. 100%. Or you get wiped out by a disease or a pest. They 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 like to know if I do this, I get this, I can sell. It's very you know business approach, which you have to. Farming is still a business. It's nice growing a plant. It's nice being a grower, but you have to always look at it still in a business way. If you don't sell and if you're not viable, 100. You know, big big difference between uh, planting 10 hectares and deciding to go on an organic approach. Or mm. planting a little uh, plant in the backyard and giving it all the love and attention you you could possibly give it. Exactly. Um, completely understood. Completely understood. Um, no, that's great. So, if I'm looking at uh, Planasa, uh, the varieties that you've mentioned to me right now, I'm actually not too familiar with. So, should I expect to start to see these type of varieties uh, more in the market? And do you suspect that these varieties are probably going to be more prevalent in the EU markets, followed by the North American market, before it ever gets to uh, the China market? Um, it's in a essence, question. it depends where your blueberries are being grown primarily. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we are established and there are plantations already in, in Latin America. Yes. So you can definitely expect to see it in the North American market. Um, we're because we're so new as well, I have to keep that in mind that we need to get the volumes up to get into the market. Um, but if also, if we think how early we are, we could probably see a good chunk. Say, this is used Peru, for example. If our varieties are coming in during their September window, or even their October window, they're going to send that here to the Europe. They send a good chunk to Europe. Um, 
and when I was listening to some uh, data and some facts, mm -hmm. was it 90% of their crop comes from August to December? So our crop is, or our varieties are likely to fall in there. And then as in from what we're going to see in the EU market from, let's say, Southern Africa, we'll definitely see as we get more plantations, we'll see more going into Europe. What are we going to see in Asia? Um, that really, I think we won't see much in China for say, but I think you will see in some of the smaller mid Middle Eastern markets and that you'll start to see our variety, particularly because of the size and the earliness. It just hits that window perfectly. Interesting. Um, Morocco is expanding at a rate. So I definitely think in that window, of anywhere from December onwards, if you watch the European market, you'll see it a lot more. Uh, the retailers are showing a lot of interest. We do a lot of work with the retailer on the grower's behalf. Because yes. like you say, it actually proves the point perfectly. You haven't heard of it. So now, why would a retailer or anyone buy it if they've never heard of it or no? So we have a dedicated team working with the, the retailers to ensure that they know of the varieties. We are continually helping them sample varieties from the different regions that we're growing. So so again, I think it's I think it's excellent that everything starts with an M. It makes it a lot easier. I promise mm -hmm. you, there's going to be a different breeder that starts with the M, and mm -hmm. oh no, that's Planasa. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really nice nice approach. They kind of know which breeder it comes from, but uh, yeah, it's just me thinking. No, I mean it's good to hear it also from a different perspective like that as well. Um, to know that it kind of creates that relatable or. Yeah, similarity it's, that you can branding in my it's, it's branding my yeah. <laughs> um okay understood understood um going back there was one more question i want to ask mm. it was really about the focus generally always seems to be on earlier varieties yeah um now if you flip that on its head is there not a benefit to have uh longer maturing varieties which are later season so for example right here at the tail end of the um, uh, blueberry exports into north america there's a huge uptick in import prices it really mm -hmm. lasts a short little gap before the domestic uh, supply in the states kicks in price comes back down to a, you know more, more modest level there's two ways you can see that either you become earlier on the u.s side or you become later on the export side. Is later variety something that's maybe interesting? Does a later, does a longer maturing berry perhaps have more flavor? Coming from uh, just my mm. general thinking. Yeah, no, you make you make a very good point there, and it's actually something that is becoming discussed more and more amongst growers and breeders. Um, if I just focus it down to Southern Africa or South Africa. Yep, done. You know, how, how is the industry going to grow? How is the industry going to become sustainable and maintain itself if everyone is focusing in a particular window? Because now if all the fruits in one window, of course, like you've mentioned there, the price just comes down like the domestic supply in America. So a very similar scenario actually happens in South Africa as well. If we look at the domestic one. So in South Africa itself, we have berries from June, July. There's some early people in June. That's normally in the north part of South Africa. Yep. And then you have supply all the way until about January. Normally, it kind of stops in January. What some people do is they put it in cold storage with all the various things like a sulfur dioxide sheet and a atmospheric bag, et cetera, et cetera, yep. to maintain the shelf life. Why? Like you said, the price goes up as you go January, February, March, April, May, June. It just goes up, up, and you get really good prices, and you're transporting. You know, your logistics costs are minimal. Yeah. Your shelf life is fantastic because, well, you're in country. So then there's a big demand, and there isn't enough supply in that period. So that's where, one, the earlier window in Zimbabwe, they like it as well because they're one of few countries in Africa that can supply to South Africa. So they're looking at South Africa more and more and saying, well, actually, this helps us. We now get an early market there. And then we go overseas. So they'll start coming in April, May, June, supplying to South Africa, filling that yes. window. But that still leaves that kind of February, March, beginning of April, where you need more volume. And that's where people are looking at 
later varieties in colder areas. Because our problem here is if you go in just like a mid-chill area, particularly on the Western Cape, January and February are notoriously very hot. You don't pick a berry in hot weather like that. Yeah. That's asking for all kinds of shelf life issues and it just it doesn't work. Yes. So they're now looking, well, where are more of our high chill zones where it doesn't get as hot at that period, but we can use these late varieties, which can then be harvested that February, March, April window. And then when it goes dormant in winter, it gets its prune, et cetera, et cetera. Normal high chill management. Gotcha. So that is one. And I think that's where Fork Creek's going to do well because they do have some later varieties like Arabella, Luna, and Loretta Blue. That's now a focus for them. But I suppose it's also because of their whole background coming from Oregon. You know, this is this is their home turf in a way in terms of high chill. Exactly. In high chill, I'd rate them at the top with their varieties. Um, yes. They really are up there. Dane, honestly, super interesting. Um, mm. I do appreciate the time that you've spent just uh, going through a bit of your background, how you see the, the market. Um, is there anything that you'd like to close off with? Uh, I literally, yeah. I'm, I can't think of uh, other questions because I've tried to give you know side questions and mm. get a little bit more uh, in depth detail, and you've 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 done a great job uh, describing uh, the market. Yeah, yeah, and no, I think you've asked some great questions there. And I mean, if I had to end off anything or what my view on the market is, my uh, I wouldn't say wise view. I haven't been in the industry long enough or as long as other people. But just what I see with fresh eyes is that it's changing a lot. All of the windows are shifting earlier. Um, Peru's coming earlier. Morocco's earlier. South Africa's earlier. Zimbabwe's earlier. These are just regions I'm in. Other countries are coming earlier in Europe. Um, so as a global supplier, everything's now moving a bit, which is going to start also determining what varieties are being planted. So people can fit those windows. Yes. Demand on a consumer level, I think is always very important. Gradually, they seem to be wanting bigger and bigger berries. But in Europe, it seems to be sitting between that 16, if anything, 18 mil. Um, but yeah, eating, eating quality or, or quality of berry is becoming very important. Yes, if there's nothing on the shelf, they'll buy whatever. But very quickly consumers can say well i like oh, buying these ones a hundred percent i mean just just to add on to what you're saying there uh, i've always been a stern believer that on the consumer level if you provide them a poor product which they can't easily distinguish with their eyes hmm. uh, it dampens demand the next week and it dampens the demand mm -hmm. further i remember for many many months and years uh, eating fruity sour uh, mm -hmm. Peruvian blueberries. <laughs> uh, it was a disaster. I stopped yeah. buying blueberries, um, but that's that's changed quite a lot. And I think mm -hmm. again, like you said, especially with the the supply coming earlier, you really have to have a good a good a good eating product and a consistently good eating product. Exactly, and what you say there touches on something that I learned from a guy called Hans Leekens. He he runs the Sequoia program now. He's with Fall Creek, and he was the the commercial manager for Fall Creek. Mm -hmm. Very interesting guy, um, and hell of a, a knowledgeable guy. And he once taught us that if you look at a truck full of punnets of berries, say they're one twenty five gram or two fifty gram, you could mm -hmm. lose anywhere up to one hundred fifty thousand consumers with that one bad load. On top of that. A repeat buyer, if they have a bad punnet, you could lose them from six to eight weeks. A new yeah. buyer, yeah. you could lose them for easily three months. That's a whole harvest season. So there's your, you know, we're meant to see this growing demand, but it could be a much more gradual and even constrict slightly if the quality is not right. So it, yeah. I think there has to be a standard. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the nicest analogies I've heard. It's so simplistic and it's to the point. Um, 100%. You lose consumers if you don't give a, a good quality product. Dane, mm -hmm. much appreciated. Um, it's always a pleasure. Week has just started. I trust you have a good week forward. Mm. Thank you. And, and uh, thanks for joining. No, it's been a great chat. Thanks a lot, Vincent. And yep. yeah, we'll talk soon. Cheers, Dane. Definitely. Let me.
manage stop recording